Okay, so uh, I guess we can start now. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening to everyone on the call from wherever you are. And then welcome once again to uh, this week's um, session on textile. Um, so, I remain, you know, the same person, the developer below, and um, we are having, having this class now. This is a third, um, a third class, uh, third session um, for the Azure Fundamental class. Um, just um, for us to know, again, uh, there is recording going on. Uh, like we have said, we ought to get your consent before we record. Uh, however, it's it has the recording has started already, and the recording is being done because we want to make the you know lessons available uh, for those that couldn't join or those that might join it somewhere in the middle of the course, and then for if every one of us on the call also to be able to go back later and um, review maybe at your own pace, and um, also to help you while you study for your exam. So um, again, if you want to talk, you can use the raise hand feature um, of Microsoft Teams. And um, as you raise your hand, um, I'll be able to see it and uh, call on you. However, if you realize that probably I didn't see your hand raised on time, uh, you could actually unmute yourself and um, speak or call my attention and I'll attend to you. Uh, so as much as possible, as we are doing, as we are taking the course or topics, uh, we are supposed to also to be doing some level of hands-on to be able to help us um, have um, maybe in-depth understanding uh, of the course or of the topics that is already being discussed. Uh, however, I just, I just want you to bear with me. Uh, if we can, we will go into the um, hands on section when, if we have the time. So we are trying as much as possible to ensure that everybody on the call, because we said it is a basic, you know, that fundamental, that first, you know, knowledge uh, that we all have to um, have about um, Microsoft um, Azure Cloud um, is, is, is the reason why we are taking our time to see as much as possible how we can explain things to you to be able to understand it. Uh, and that is also, okay, eating into our lab times. So just like last week, what we can also do is at the end of the course or at the end of the class, uh, we will drop um, uh, we'll drop the lab files or also we can always access it right from the channel to be able to follow the lab through based on you know, what we were able to learn in the class. And then you can write your questions down, you can chat, post your questions on the chat during the class, maybe the next class or even uh, while you are doing the lab at your own time, if you have any question, post it in the channel and we'll be willing to respond to you and assist you when necessary. So, uh, last week we started with module two of the course and then call Azure um, services. So, and then this is where we stop. We are to pick up this week from co Azure workloads that's in terms of products uh, that you have available to you in Azure. Uh, so also, it's also good if the time is interactive. So while the course is going on and you have, uh, the class is going on rather, and you have um, questions, either chat, like I said, or unmute your mouth, mic to speak and then and ask your question. So, um, so, so, 
um we are going to start this week with hold on please Okay, so we are going to start with um, Azure workloads as um, we'll be talking about um, Azure virtual machines, app services, that's in, in the area of computing services, and then um, serverless computing services like Azure Container Service and um, the Kubernetes service, and we'll talk briefly about Azure virtual desktop. Uh, it used to be called Windows Virtual Desktop in Azure before, but it's been renamed. And then around network um, services, we'll also talk about uh, the virtual network, how your network is set up for in Azure, similar to that of your on-premises infrastructure. Talk about the VPN gateway and then the um, express route. That's a form of um, private connection between your ISP and the Azure cloud. Then on the storage services aspect, we'll talk about the different storage, though there are a lot of different storage. There is the blob storage, the disk storage, the file storage, the queue storage uh, type, the table storage types and all of that. But we'll just you know talk about a few of them. Uh, because this course is, as you say, is a uh, is the fundamental, you know, aspect or the is a fundamental course. So, like during the exam, really, uh, you are not going to be tested based on all the services and how they interconnected uh, to each, how they interconnect to each other. Uh, but you are just going to be tested based on basic understanding of maybe what they do and where to find them uh, or within Azure and probably just certain settings, but they just want you to have an idea of um, you know, each of those services that they're actually there and can be used and in which scenarios uh, will you be using each of them. Then around the database service, like I said, there's the other cloud services. So there's what we call uh, database as a service, that's, so we'll be talking about the common um, type of databases that are available and can be set up in Azure. And um, finally, we'll talk about uh, Azure Marketplace. So Azure Marketplace, last week, we talked a little bit about Azure Marketplace, uh, but we'll, we'll probably talk more about it this week. So let's start with a uh, virtual machine. Uh, if you recall, in our uh, that's that's last week. That's last week lesson. Um, we talk about you know uh, virtual machine a bit, and then we even went through the demo of how to set it up. Um, so virtual machine really, like I said, I said Azure is powered by by virtualization technology. So it's it's existing. It's built on virtualization, using virtualization. So um, what is uh, virtualization? Virtualization is actually um, a software, uh, 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 a software, you know, layer on your physical hardware or your physical operating system. So it uses software to create what we call an ab abstraction layer over computer hardware. So that way it allows you to be able to uh, if you like to say logically break down one physical machine into um, multiple virtual or multiple logical machines. So why using a particular computer? And what happened is once you enable the virtualization, what it does is each of the processing power, each of, each of the computes, you know, uh, a component of the physical machine is being used or is being translated into the virtual machine environment. So your virtual machines or your VMs, they are also making use of the physical uh, 
um, memory, physical processors that you have on the physical computer. Uh, um, why will you do this? We do this majorly to reduce the number of physical hardware that we purchase and probably set up in the data center. The more hardware you have in the data center, the more power that is required to power them up and all of that. So you want to save on a lot of things. That's why you will go into what we call um, virtualization uh, uh, environment. And now the moment you enable virtualization on a computer, on a physical computer, the, the, you need to create the computers that are the virtual computers that you create on that hardware now is called virtual machines. Sometimes you can see the world as guests, uh, guests on a host. So a guest on a host is also referring to, uh, uh, to virtual machines um, that is uh, created and hosted on that host. So in, in other words, I would say also virtual machine is, is like a software emulator that emulates the physical computer. So why using the physical memory, the storage, the networking, uh, the processor, and everything. Each of the virtual machines that is created on a particular physical computer have its own operating system and will be managed as if you are actually sitting down in front of that computer to manage it. So you can also you do the things to manage it like using remote desktop or connecting directly to the host and then launching the virtual machine um, consoles to be able to manage. But you know, in the cloud now, we do not have access to the physical host. So most of the time, it's only the virtual host, the virtual machines that we have access to. So how do we connect to, to them to manage them? Is using remote desktop access or remote desktop client to be able to connect to those virtual machines. And uh, so we can use the virtual machines when created for different purposes. Different purposes like tests, purpose, you can use it to uh, quickly maybe set up a development environment. You can use it to quickly to host your applications in the cloud. So and then when you look at virtual machines, uh, it's, a, it's a platform as a service offering, which we say is the, is the one, that's the type of service that give you the most control on your, uh, uh, on the cloud. So it's as good as you are having, it, it gives you that flexibility and common management uh, tools and options that you have in, um, when, you are, when you set up a, an IPv server in your on-premise environment. So, uh, like I said, uh, we'll be able to go just bear with me. Uh, we did this last week, though we didn't go ahead maybe to connect to them and all of that. And I also dropped a note or a lab uh, document that was or a lab guide that was a follow to kind of create. So I believe uh, uh, those that were on the call last week was able to try out, you know, their hands on how to create a virtual machine. Um, sorry, could you mute yourself, please? Okay, yeah, so please, uh, as you join the call and leave, uh, while you join, just please ensure you mute yourself so that the class is not um, kind of um, distracted uh, or disrupted, rather. Uh, so now uh, let's talk about one of the services that we have in Azure, uh, that is Azure App Service. Azure App Service enable you to be able to build and post your web, um, your web applications, 
uh, background job, mobile backend, and RESTful uh, uh, and APIs rather in the programming language of your choice without managing the infrastructure. So we talk about it last week. The app service, Azure app services, they are actually um, infrastructure. Sorry, platform as a service offering. So it allow you to be able to uh, quickly set up an environment and to run your code, to deploy your code, test it, and then launch it to production. So, uh, and we say it's usually used by developer. You looking at, you know, even you looking at the screen, you notice you have things like um, .NET, .NET Core, Node.js, uh, Java, Python, PHP, and whatever programming language that you speak, you can find them in Azure. So when you set up an app service, one of the things you need to do is to select which environment or which language you are going to be using on that particular app service. And the app service, as we said, is just like a web server. It's a web server. It's make use of the background. It makes use of IIS, really to be able to set up the web server for you on a, either on a, on a window machine. So you also have the ability while you're creating the app service to select that you want a Linux uh, virtual machine. So that is a pass. We said it does not allow you, you, you don't have to manage the fiscal with the operating system. You don't have to manage the update patches and all of that. But there is still, um, there is still operating system or a virtual machine that is created behind the scene where you are, uh, 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 where that IIS service or web service is being installed. It's not just IIS you can, depending on the kind type of um, um, uh, language that you are picking, you can also uh, set up, um, um, what's the name of, so Apache, Apache. So PHP, for instance, make use a lot of Apache uh, web service. So it supports, just have that a lot of um, variety. And is you are able to scale up and scale down depending on the, uh, depending on the demands of whatever application or website you are hosting on that particular app service. So you can configure auto scaling and can configure high availability like uh, specifying the, the zones, uh, whether you want it to be locally uh, available or locally redundant or to be geo redundant. So we talk about all of that last week where we talk about pairing different data centers, uh, you know, for you to be able to have that high availability you know, deployment of your services in Azure. So when you are talking about creating an app service now, you have the option to create different kinds of app services. There is what we call the web apps. The web app supports, you know, it's, it, it's, it, it, it's, it includes full support for hosting web applications using all of these services that we are looking at like in ASP.NET, uh, ASP.NET Core, Java, in even Ruby, Python, and all of that. And then let's say you want to set it up on the virtual machine using the infrastructure as a service uh, uh, part of Azure. What you need to do, you set up, you create your virtual machine. And after creating your virtual machine, you need to go and install or enable if a role, that's the web server role called IIS and there are requirements for that IIS to actually be configured or installed on that machine. You will have to install .NET, um, .NET maybe 3.5 or .NET 4.5, though by default .NET 4.5 is installed. But depending on the application that you want to post, it might be that it require .NET 3.5. So you will have to install all of that. You have to install enable services and configure the uh, an IIS server role by yourself to suit what you want to use it to host. Another type of service, app service that you can create is the um, API. So API, 
really. You create them for you to be able to, when you create an API, what you really want to use it for is to connect to another service and pull data from that service. So take, for instance, you have, um, you have uh, a website, let's say, uh, um, yes, Amazon, let's use Amazon website, for instance, to, to do that example. And then your own website, you want to be able to link products that are on Amazon website. You want to be able to link it to your own website. So now what you would do is you create an API that can talk to Amazon server and it will go into the product catalog aspect of it and request, make a request for the product list that they have and it will bring it and put it on your own website for people to be able to quickly see it without going to Amazon website. That's an example of where you want to use an API. Another instance is you have a web server and on this web server you have certain services that you are hosting. So now you need people before they can do anything, they should create an account. So if they are creating an account, it means they have to create a username and password. So uh, uh, when they create this account, you can decide to say, okay, you will use an identity service somewhere else to host those user accounts that people are creating. So now if I create my account the first time, the subsequent time I will come to try to log in, there will be an API behind that go from my website to the identity platform where I'm, I, I store each person's credential to go and confirm that I have this user there, then it will bring, the moment the person log in, it will check what right or what rule, what product does this person have. It automatically bring it up and present it to the user. So that is an example of, another example of where you want to use uh, API, uh, um, API, uh, you know, to create API apps, type of app service for you to be able to run. There's also what we call um, web jobs uh, uh, that allow you to be able to run a program like a .exe program, a Java program, uh, or even scripts or PowerShell uh, uh, app. So that's what web jobs allow you to do. It's more like you can use it to schedule just like jo the, the word job, you use it to schedule. And you know, most of the time you can use script. You can schedule uh, a task using a script, more like if anything, if this happened, run this script, or at this particular time of the day, run this script. So like the Amazon that I talk about, so I can create a schedule using web job to say at uh, 2 a.m. every day, go to, an API to go to um, Amazon website and go and import or export, and go and ex export, that's check Amazon website, there are new products that have been added to the catalog. Check them at that particular time of the night and upload them into my own website so that at interval, people have updated content on my website, you know, based on. Then there's the mobile application you know, app service type of thing that allow you to be able to host the backend really for mobile apps like the Android app, the iOS app, you know, and Windows app and all of that. So that is, those are instances where you will create, um, where you will create, you know, a kind of app service in, uh, in Azure. So moving on, uh, we can quit um, Excuse me, sorry. Yes, please. Please have a question. Sorry for stopping you. No problem. Um, the API, the example you gave, the second example about um, um, creating an external, um, um, like a, a an, ex an external sign on for maybe you have another page that you need to press it to go and log in to be able to access some services. Yeah. So I wanted to ask, so is an API like creating an, an external URL? Mm, not really. 
not an external URL per se. So that content, the API now, uh, is like creating a mini app. Well, that app is not really an app per se, but it's, it just gives you an interface to be able to say you want to do one or two things. So there's a URL involved in this, but what is not the URL? The URL, you will need the URL, for instance, of the destination application or destination site where you are going and input it into your API. So it's, it's like a form. Yes, let me put it that way. It's like a form that you have. And on this form, one of the questions on the form or one of the item to fill is your name, your, your names, maybe your, uh, whether you are employed or not, your, if you are employed, your role at work, and then you have a website. There will be a field where you need to maybe put in your website or your LinkedIn address. So in this case now, it's like a form that you fill all of those things that you want to be able to pick from a particular destination where you are going to pick that information from. Now, uh, for you to be able to do that, you will need to do a form of authentication at the target. So when we say target, target is the destination where you want to pull that information from. So you have to generate what we call token. That token is generated to be like, a, like your password within that API uh, interface. Just like it's, a, it's application programming interface. So it allows you to be able to use programming language or bring programming, a bit of programming into, you know, uh, uh, into an environment. So if you have a programming language. So let, let me give another instance. Um, I will take, you want to build a report, for instance. And uh, where is this report? You have an Excel that contain a lot of information and you have it is sitting down on a particular server, right? Or let me, let me say you have that Excel sitting down in your uh, OneDrive, your OneDrive for business, if you have OneDrive, maybe Microsoft account. Now you want a situation for things like uh, Power BI, for instance, to go there and pull Build certain report, and on that report, you want to see maybe the username, the people that sign up for accounts. It might be a bank, for instance, information that you have there. So what you will do is you have this API, or you build this API, or there might already there might already be existing APIs that have been built. So you, when you open it, you will put the URL, the location of that access file. You have to put it in there. Now, when the API go to the location, you will be requested to supply a credential that you have a form of authorization, you know, that is authorized to come and access that particular service or that particular file that you want to is asking for information for. So you have to generate a token to put it. So the API is like a form that have different fields that you have to fill based on what you want to pull and then how you want to authorize or authenticate at the location where you want to pull those data from. Am I able to? Understood, Understood ma. Thank you. You're welcome. OK, so uh, maybe quickly. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. OK, I think you will permit me to um, just um, go and come back to this, or come back, please. Just permit me. So let's talk quickly about container service. Uh, we briefly make mention of this in our past lesson or past class where we talk about serverless computing. So container service are um, a type of serverless computing uh, service that are available in Azure. So uh, there are actually virtualization environments that run applications like virtual machines, containers, you know, they run like virtual machines. But then the thing is, you are not managing the virtual machines, you are not managing the operating system that, that is, you know, that's running on those 
uh, within the container service. So uh, uh, they are usually lightweight. And the reason for their being lightweight is the fact that you're not managing that operating system, the underlying operating system that we talked about you know, earlier. They are used uh, uh, unlike is the pass, unlike the virtual machine. Just like I said, even though you are creating a container, the container has some set of virtual machines that are creating at the background, but that is none of your business, really. Take an example like this. Uh, you have an application that you want to actually deploy, maybe in the Google Play Store, for instance. You want people you deploy, develop this application as a developer. You want to be able to um, make this application available for people to be able to use. Uh, so you need a location for you to store that application. And then through from that location, you go into your um, Google Google um, Google Store you know, account. So you have to create an account. So you go into it, and then you make reference to it and publish it. And subsequently, me, as an ordinary user, can go to my Google Play Store and go and then um, pick that application and install it on my own computer. So I, I'll be sorry on my phone. Now I've installed it on my phone. It's none of my business, you know. I won't concern myself with what kind of language do they use to write this application? Where do they host the code? What and what service is running? Is it a, a is it is it a, a Java application? Is it? I don't really need to concern myself about that. So that's the way exactly container service work. It help you to uh, put your applications in a container. And when we talk about container, we will also talk about what would they call container registry. So container registry is actually a, uh, a place, let me say it that way, or a service that allow you to host images. So I can build different images and put it and register it in the registry. So registry is more like you're just registering that service. In, in, it's like you have a register where you create a particular service now, and then you go and register it that this service exists, it's here. So now that registry must exist before you can say you want to create what we call container instance. So container instance on the other hand is like you going into the registry to pull a copy of an image that has been created that is existing. You pull it, and then you are able to now deploy your applications to it. So I would say containers really, the bundle libraries, libraries and components that is required to run the application and using the existing operating system you know, that is running on that particular container. So for example, now you have, um, uh, we have five type of, uh, five containers that are running. Okay, so let me say you, you created five containers, yeah, that are running on a particular server with a specific Linux kernel now. So what is Linux kernel? Linux kernel is like, we are talking about a Linux operating system in this case now. It's like, the middleman between the operating system, that's the computer hardware, the application, or the software that is running on that computer. So it's like the brain of the computer. And that one is usually an open source that you can use without the need for you to pay for it. So now let's go back to uh, container service or container instance now. Is a software as a sorry platform as a service um, offering, and they offer you the fastest and simplest way to run a container service in Azure. So you don't have to manage the underlying virtual machine. You don't have to configure any additional services. You just set it up, and then automatically the way container service work is you have the ability for it to scale. That's scale up, scale in scale out you know scaling out you know you mean uh, sorry scaling up means probably you want to increase the 
computing power, like in terms of memory. Maybe the, the virtual machine that are also in that container, for instance, they were running 16 gig of RAM, four processor, and now depending on resource, it requires more processing power. So you can just switch, you know, you automatically rather it switches based on the traffic that is eating, it switches that resources and increase them. Then there are now cases where you want to probably maybe create uh, multiple instances of it. So that means you have more virtual machine, you will add more virtual machines now and use load balancing service to load balance the resources you need. So majorly that is how computer container service work. Now, Azure Kubernetes on the other end is, is an automating, uh, uh, um, it helps you to automate tasks and manage them in a large, you know, in a large scale or large, large container scale. So that's kind of what this thing is called orchestration. And like I said last week, when you hear the word orchestration, it just have to do with automation. Automation, I want this thing to happen. If, if this happen, let this other thing happen. And the load is increasing, automatically increase the number of virtual machines. So it's like a load balancer, that's AKS in Azure, that's Azure Kubernetes service. It's like a load balancer that help you to load balance and distribute the resources for your container environment. So uh, container service, I will also say it come handy when it comes to um, microservices. Microservices, these days, the way services are being built or the way applications are being built is you build them in small, small junk and you now have something that now unites them that integrate each of them together. And why will you use a microservice? Is the reason is if there's a problem with a module, for instance. So if there's a problem with, with a module, for instance, you are able to just face the problem with that module. And whatever you're doing on that module doesn't have to affect any other service that is happening that you have. So let me give you maybe a logical example here. Let's look at um, Amazon. I'm sorry, I'm using Amazon a lot, but that's what quickly come to mind. So on Amazon, for instance, you have your catalog. The product catalog is actually a service on its own that is created. Now, you have your carts. When you are pick a product, you add it into your cart. That cart, you go there, you are able to see the list of products or items that you have added to your cart. That cart itself is another separate service on its own. Uh, then you have the payment service where you have to either put your card or if they support different kind of payment option, like maybe PayPal using the PayPal card or card from your bank or, you know, maybe Bitcoin and all of that. Those are still form of payment. So they have to be what we call payment gateway that is also integrated with the app. It's also like, it's like an API also that you build and is able to connect to different uh, online payment services to be able to, uh, to allow you to securely make payment for whatever item you are purchasing from the Amazon store, right? So that payment service or payment gateway is also a separate module or separate service on its own, that is sitting on its own. So now there will now be something that unites all of them, that integrate them. What is now uniting I would say that Kubernetes service also help you in this area. So when a user goes to the website, they pick, they pick, uh, um, let's say a laptop from the cat, open the catalog. They they go to product. When you click the product, it will connect to the catalog and open the catalog for that particular user that is logged on to the to the website. Now, when the user pick and add it to cart and he click the cart button take the user now to this particular, this other location, this other application for him to be able to see all the products that he has selected. Now, 
the next thing is you want to make payment, right? There's also an automation behind that said, the moment the user click cart and it said complete purchase or checkout, you click the checkout button. The next thing you should present to them is the payment options that they can use. Then once they put in you know, information about maybe their card and they click to now maybe make pay, payment rather. Uh, there's also an automation behind that's okay. Go to whichever bank the person has, you know, uh, um, supply the card for and go and make a request to withdraw certain amount of money from the person's account. So these are different microservices. Now, these microservices can be put together in a container. The container is not the one that is uniting them to say, okay, all of these services that you require for this particular uh, solution or product to function effectively, I can put them in this particular container, let them be there. So that's the best way I would say I can explain, you know, the container service uh, uh, in Azure. So us, please, if you have any question, uh, let me know. So one of the less uh, one of the uh, 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 lab we have also is to be able to create a container and test it. We won't be able to create um, Azure Kubernetes service. And like I said, the Kubernetes service actually is a, um, is an open source, so it's free. What you are paying for there is the different containers that you create and the different resources that is running behind. So you are paying for those resources and then you can use it to host your applications. So I think before we go further, let me reshare my screen. And uh, we can quickly uh, probably touch some of those labs that we have just skipped. Okay. So can we see this, my desktop, please? Yes, I can see. Yes, we can. So, so what I'm going to do first is to log in to porta.azure.com. And one of the first service we want to create here is uh, the VM. No, I will go to app service. Guess my internet is a bit it's slow. Wow, I think so. This is going to take much of my time. Here is another browser. Take so long.
So, show that. Okay. Let's show some other account. So we are going to create uh, an app service here. Yeah? You know, it's a create app service using Docker, right? And then uh, even as you type app service, the first thing you see is, sorry, as you type Docker, the first thing you see, see is app service. So I'll just click app service. Now, when creating app service, uh, like we said, there's an underlying um, you know, virtual machine. You will see how that is. You know, you have to make decision actually to tell which you know operating system you want to be running on that virtual machine. So I'll just click create. When you click app service, search for app service, it will bring you here, and all your app services that you have, you will see them in here. So I'll create app service. Internet is not so friendly today. Okay. So now, if you recall, we went through all of this last week, where if you want to create anything, really, you must select, you must select the, uh, you must select the subscription where you want to create it from. And we also talk about resource group. So resource group, I'm going to, like we say, is like a container where all your services, all your resources are hosted. So I will just call it textile. I'll Anything we are creating will be in this um, resource group. So now, one of the things I need to do is to specify a name for my web for my app service. So this name is what I will type in my browser each time I want to kind of access maybe the website that I want to hold, host, for instance. So I'm just going to type. Uh, I love app service, right? What it will do is it will check if that name has already been taken or not. So here I'm going to pick Docker container and it's now going to ask me for the on the underlying operating system that I want to host. So I can either choose Linux or I choose Windows. So like I said, the VM that we set up, if we wanted to create a website, we will have to go and install IIS. So recall, we also talk about region. So I have to select my region. I like to use um, the West Europe region. Um, so then the next thing now, this is where I get to choose the size of virtual machine. It's called app service plan. So on this app service plan, for instance, if I create it, that's creating that virtual machine, I can at the end of the day, create multiple websites or multiple app service on this particular virtual machine. And I can increase the processing power based on how I want it. So to choose, it has already picked premium for me. This is too high. 
because the higher you pick, the higher the, the, the VM that you select, the more you pay for it. So this is just a test environment, for instance. Uh, what you need to do is to click the change size, change size uh, uh, on that there, and it will bring you to this page. Now, the application you want to host, depending on what feature and what feature you want that particular server or the underlying virtual machine to have for you to be able to. So let's say, for instance, if you want people to, to be accessing your website, for instance, using a name, or maybe www.textilers.com. I will want to ensure that whatever plan I'm picking have what we call custom domain and XSL option. So for me to be able to add my own custom domain, textilers.com is a custom domain. But what Azure will give me now is whatever name I pick, dot Azure um, website.com is what is going to give me, or dot, sorry, dot net is what is going to give me. But if I want to use textiler.com, then I have to make sure whatever plan I'm selecting have this. So you see that auto scaling as well is uh, enabled depending on the plan. You have the free one, which is under the test and development environment here. So uh, now because of the type of app service that we are looking at, Docker, uh, is we are not having the option to pick any free option. So we have to go to, and you notice it's picking. So let's, you notice it's already picked premium. And as you change, the more, the more memory or processor that you need, the more you pay for it. You see, if I pick this now, this is just two, and this is four CPU. This is 18, eight, and this is 16. You notice the, the money has kind of double or more than double can, you know, as you pick, it's going to be doubling it for you. So let's just pick uh, this one, for instance, or better still, or because we don't have much money. So if I pick this, for instance, what I need to do, now I'm picking just a code to deploy a code. What I need to do is I have to specify the runtime environment. With, we've talked about this a lot. You notice .NET, .NET core, um, Java, Node.js, PHP, you know, Python, Ruby, and all of it. So I have to select. So let's just pick .NET 5, for instance. And I also have to comp the operating system still have to be. So now I've selected my. So if I go back now, you notice that's changing from premium to standard. So depending on the service, it's already giving you. Now here, let's go back to, now it enable the free tier, though this free tier, if what I need is just this, and the only thing I have is one gig memory, and uh, sorry, one gig storage, and the memory is just one gig also. So I can either choose this, depending on what I want. If I choose this, you add more feature. If I choose this, you add more feature. Then if you go to production. So let's just pick a standard, for instance. Let's pick this because you have custom domain just in case we we want, you know, uh, where's the, where's the, where's, where's this, okay, sorry. Then we click apply. So you can actually change the size as you want. Now, because of the type I pick, I cannot select the type of redundancy that I want. So this also, just like I said, you have to select what you want there for you to be able to get the feature that you're looking for. So what I just do is I just click create and it will create the app service for me. And once you finish creating, I can actually download this template to automate the creation of app service or subsequent app service if it is the same uh, computing or parameter that I need. Just like when we were creating virtual machine, you see different tabs here that allow you to select virtual machine network and other things. So the same way, you have a few things that you might want to select here, but let's just click um, create. So what it will do is to validate all the settings and then create it accordingly. And it doesn't take time. That's what we talk about, agility. You know?
Um, so the moment you finish creating, all I need to do is just go and copy the URL and paste it in the browser. And my website is you know, ready. It's just for me now. If I want to customize it, I can now decide to be customizing it. So why this is running, uh, let's see what okay. that we need to create is container instance. This is a function of my internet, so do mind me. So it brings you next to this page where it's telling you what and what is you know happening at the background. If it's a virtual machine, you will see all the tasks that are being performed where it attach operating system, where it attach um, to a resource group, where it attach to a particular network, where it, the NSG, that's the network security group that I create for you to be able to configure things like uh, ports that you want to be open on that particular server and all of that you will see. So once it's finished, uh, um, you, we can just go in and start, you know, and start using the service few more seconds. So doesn't mean I can't leave this page. I can actually leave the page and go and do something else. The task will continue. So up here, you can see this bell icon. This is also telling you what and what is happening within your um, subscription. So. <clears throat> so, like I said, you see all of that. Now, let's go to the resource. So, on this resource, you can actually do a lot of things. And when we talk about scaling, so scaling up, that's vertical. Vertical scaling, where you increase the RAM, the processor, then scaling out is horizontal, where you increase the instance, that's the number of the server. This is the address that I put or the name. I'll just open that in a new uh, tab and automatically we have a, a website up and running. That's how quickly, how quickly you can, can create, spin up an app service or a web app in Azure. So, uh now let's go back you can always go back home and search always let's type container so here when i talk about container registry and then container instance so we just pick um container instance so I will create a container instance by clicking create. Okay. Uh, the thing is, if it's kind of taking time, do we have any question? Anybody have any question? And this is going on. However, if I see that it's taking more time, I might have to skip it to continue. I'm going to have a copy of the slide of the slide. Maybe um, we can use it for revision or something. Yes, we can share the copy of the slide or like a lab document, a lab guide. Although we can share this slide also. Yeah, we can share the slide. And, okay, so you might have joined late. Uh, at the end of the class, also we will drop. Um, this is taking time. Sorry, so I might have to let me continue. Uh, so we'll drop all the lab uh, document or lab guide for this particular module for you to be able to try your hands on them and drop your question in the channel. That's if you have any or any issue, you face any issue while you are quitting during your hands-on, uh, you know, uh, during, while you are creating your lab. So you can drop it and then we'll attend to you. So, okay. so I will share my screen again.
So like this um, service that we just created, no, this web app, um, is it like, is it exactly the same thing like when you maybe pay for a regular host and then you have um, a place to host your app? Or what's yes. like the difference yeah. between it? Yes, it is. It is. So say for instance, you have, um, you go to, like Google that and go that, right? And you subscribe to web hosts. What they are also giving you is they are giving you an environment, like a web server, for you to be able to host your website. That's is the same, is the same exact. But the thing with this with app service is now the fact that it's supporting any language, and you have more security and more control compared to the web hosting. Uh, sorry, compared to what you get from GoDaddy. So what you get from GoDaddy majorly. The moment you you uh, subscribe for the service, they give you maybe like a URL for you to be able to upload, maybe an FTP or SSH kind of, for you to be able to upload your content onto the website. That's majorly uh, what you can do is to develop, build your website and take the file to go and upload. But in Azure, you get more control. You get to say, okay, there's a lot of traffic on my website now. I need to increase the processing power I need to increase the instances, which on other web hosting site, they don't have all of those flexibility. So that's your question. Yeah, it's very well. Um, and I also want this issue of um, a domain name service. Does Azure, um, Azure also offer like a domain name service or so we have to go and get from all those regular um, domain name service provider? Yes, Azure does. There's a um, domain services. There's what we call DNS services in Azure. So you can actually purchase domain through Azure and then host it. And all your DNS record that you need to, uh, each time you need to make a change or add a DNS record, you go to Azure under the DNS zone to go and add that particular record as, as the need arises. So yes, you can purchase Azure through Sorry, do me through Azure as well. Okay, so I guess uh, if there are no further questions, we can continue. Uh, now let's talk a bit about um, desktop, virtual desktop. Uh, like I said, it was used, it was called before uh, Windows virtual desktop. So Windows virtual desktop still exists but that's when it comes to the on-premises environment. But in Azure, it's now called Azure Virtual Desktop. And it's, let me just simply to put, it is just a way for you to virtualize your desktop. Instead of you, you know, uh, uh, purchasing, you know, let's say you have a new, you want to set up a new business now, and yes, your user, you are going to employ people, they will need, computers to do their work. But at this particular stage now, uh, you do not have maybe the fund to purchase laptop for everybody or even desktop. So you can set up what we call a virtual desktop in Azure. All people need to do is either use their phone or their personal laptops at home to just open a browser and enter a URL and it will take them to automatically provision or uh, uh, automatically as they enter the URL, it provision a virtual machine for them, and then they are able to sign in and do their work. So also look at the work from home. Since the work from home started because of the pandemic, a lot of people started you know, investing more in the Azure virtual desktop. Why are they also doing that? Apart from the fact that you do not have budget or you do not have phone. The other reason and the main and critical reason you want to use Azure Virtual Desktop is uh, might be a, as a result of com compliance issue because you want your data to always remain with you. You do not want your user to go about with your data on their computer. So in that case, you will set up, you will set up virtual environments that are running Windows 10 or Windows 11. Then on each of the Windows 11 already, you will have applications. You have their office, office that contain Outlook, 
that contain maybe any other application they need to do their work. You will already pre install all of those things. And as each person open a browser on their computer, they are automatically presented with a Windows 10 or a Windows 11 interface and they can continue to do their work as if they have the Windows machine in front of them, you know, that they're using. So uh, uh, it's usually, uh, um, it's, it's, it reduces, you know, costs when you have to use what we call pool. So what's a pool now? A pool can be, you can have, uh, a pool most of the time contain more than one computer or more than one instance of a particular uh, um, service that you are, they are, you are actually using. So it's like a group of service or a group of computer that you group together. So each time people connect, you just pick a computer from that pool and assign to the users as they connect. So you allow you, in that case, you, you do what we call multiple sessions. It's just like you are doing the remote desktop, the computer. But this time now, uh, uh, there's a license, there's an underlying license that is applying to it that now allow even multiple people to connect to the same computer at the same time and work as if it's their own personal computer in the, in the, in the office. So that's probably maybe how best I can explain uh, the virtual desktop to you. Yes, please. Um, from your explanation, so how, um, let's say I'm working on a virtual desktop, I'm working on a Word document, and then okay. I access and all of that, and then I reconnect, do I get to still see that document? Yes, you get to still see the document. So once you connect, and it create a particular, it connects you to a particular virtual machine that's client virtual machine. It creates your profile on that machine. It's just like it's exactly the same way that you have your computer now. And um, before you can you power on the computer, you need an account, right? To log into your computer to be able to do whatever you want to do. So maybe that computer is even being shared by multiple people in your house. I'm talking about your personal computer now. You create an account for yourself, you can create an account for maybe a brother or a daughter who we also need and is for a son. Each person have their own account on that machine. So each time you log in with your own account and you work, your work remain on that profile. It doesn't get deleted. So the same thing apply in uh, Azure Virtual Desktop as well. So, okay. yes, exactly. Thank you. So. Let's continue now with the uh, Azure networking services. Uh, so now I will be talking about spinning up virtual machines, spinning up app services and all of that. One thing is each service you create in Azure, there's also a, an underlying network environment or networking that is tied to it. So like the example we saw, we created an app service and we took the URL of that app service, put it in a browser, and it took us to the website we just created. So what happened is for me to be able to use that URL, put it on the browser anywhere in the world, there's a public IP that is assigned to that particular virtual machine that we created earlier. So that public IP will automatically bind in DNS. It will bind, you know, the IP to the name that we created. So each time I go to the internet and I open my browser and I type that URL, it's actually DNS will respond to me to say, okay, this URL is tied to this IP address and it's able to present or render the service that I'm asking, you know, for me. So Azure Virtual Network really is a, a I would say is logical isolation of network in Azure. Look at this scenario uh, in a physical environment, right? Uh, we say if you have to set up your own data center, you will need to also consider 
the networking aspect of it. You have to buy routers, you have to buy switches, you have to buy firewall to protect. So the VNet, that's Azure Virtual Desktop, uh, sorry, network is in, in short form, it's called VNet. So each time you hear VNet, just remember, this virtual network in Azure that we are referring to. So it's like a switch, you know, it's like a virtual switch or router that allow you to be able to connect each of the resources, like virtual machines, for instance, each of them to that same switch, and everybody can then talk to each other. So each time you create a virtual machine, there is a virtual network that is also created alongside. And that virtual network have IP. Usually you have a subnet of IP, which subnet can also be further divided into smaller subnets. So, and most of the time is usually private IP. But if you need that network to render services to, uh, um, to render services to public internet, to public people, uh, to people on the public internet or on the internet, then you will need the public IP to be assigned. Public IP now, or IP address, take that as your your own unique name within your family. So that's the way I can put IP addressing now. IP addressing, you take an IP address as your own unique name within your family. So each person in the family have their own name. If they call uh, um, Peter, they know who is Peter. So likewise in Azure, if I give an IP, that IP must be assigned to a particular device or a particular resource. And only that resource can respond if I query that IP. So, also through the Azure, uh, uh, also through the VNet, you are able to enable maybe com communication between the Azure and the your on-premises infrastructure. Now we'll take that now to another level. A situation where you have some services on-prem, right? And then you are enabling hybrid, you know, hybrid and cloud. That means you will be hosting some of your services in Azure and why some will remain on-prem. Now, each of the environment need to be able to talk to each other. So how do you enable them to talk to each other? This is the, the, the VNet is a switch or a router, like I said. Now, for you to be able to connect the VNet in Azure to the VNet on-prem, you need to use the, what we call the, a technology called virtual private network, you know, to be able to set up a secure tunnel, or a, yes, a secure tunnel between the two environments such that your data that you are transversing or you are sending, maybe you set up an application that have to replicate across. Now, or you have database on-premise, and then you have your app service in the cloud. The app service that is in the cloud need to talk to the database that is hosted on-prem. So in that case, you will need what we call virtual private gateway. So on the VNet, you can introduce a gateway. Is that gateway that will establish VPN like IPsec VPN connectivity, that's a secure tunnel between Azure and your on-prem gateway. So on the on-prem gateway, you need to obtain the public IP that you have there. Go and start configuring a part, the VPN and get all the parameter and then take it to the cloud to go and put those parameter also. Parameters like pre-share key. So for the for there to be an handshake between the two gateways, there have to be some form of authentication. That authentication type is called pre-shared key. So we have a key or a code that both you and I will know. So because the two of us know that key, we can talk to each other securely. So that's the way Azure um, VPN gateway work. So um, this way it's usually configured and connecting. The connectivity is over the public internet. Now we can take this VPN team now or connectivity between the on-prem and cloud, we can take it to the next level. Their environment or 
look at this scenario where you have, or where an organization said, okay, we have this critical service that is highly confidential in nature. And then we need to be able to host this service, part of this service in Azure. Now, for them to be able to talk to each other, replicate, get data across from each other, it has to pass through. We don't want to pass through the general internet, internet, the public internet. We don't want to go through that. So in this case, you have to go to your ISP, right? And ask them to give you a service called Express Route. Now, Express Route is, take it like a, a list line. If you, most of us uh, understand telephony. So you can go and list a line from a telephony service. The day you stop paying for it, you release their numbers to them or you release that particular line to them. So take it like a list line or a dedicated connectivity. It look like VPN, but really you are not the one configuring it now. Your ISP, maybe like a main one or at and can set up such service to just connect, to set up a tunnel between themselves and Azure Gateway. So this way now, you are not setting up VPN, or you are just setting up a tunnel. And it's usually very fast, that's in terms of speed, it's usually very fast and secure. It's like a private connection that you're establishing between your ISP and only your data is passing through that, that tunnel. So at the end of the day, it's very, very expensive to maintain. But then, if your uh, compliance requirement or policy warrant you to kind of re uh, 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 subscribe to such service, then that is what you will be using. So like I said, it does not pass through the user, um, the user uh, public internet. So I will also move this that's creating uh, um, creating virtual network and then we'll create a virtual machine where we'll test connection between the two virtual machines. So you see how virtual machine or virtual sorry virtual network is able to be created and how you assign IP to devices on the same subnets and they are able to talk or communicate with each other without problem. We'll come back to that later because you permit me, like I said. Let's quickly talk about Azure storage, storage services. Recall when we're describing cloud computing, we said cloud computing is the provisioning or rendering of computing services in the cloud. And these services is inclusive of your servers, is inclusive of your network is inclusive of your storage and so so now let's talk about the storage azure storage services actually like we have said in several occasions is a, is microsoft's storage solution for modern data storage you know in in the cloud so it offer you you know a massive scaling object ability to store data objects I will explain that maybe further in a while. Then, excuse me. So the type of, um, uh, there are different type of storage in Azure really, and each storage type is being used for different scenario, different use cases. So let's take for instance, the first one on the list, which is, Azure Blob, Blob Storage, so container storage. So when anybody say Blob Storage, just take, that's, that's, that's what they mean. So Blob Storage is, um, is an object storage solution for you. It is optimized for storing large, as in, when we mean large, we mean massive, massive amount of data. What type of data? Unstructured data. And unstructured data are, data that does not uh, maybe comply or adhere to a particular data model. 
So this type of data can be text, it can be binary data, and um, but they are actually, they are usually large. They are usually very large. It can be images also, very large images. So you will use blob storage, maybe if in a situation where you have large images and you want to present these images to or this kind of document, you want to present it to a website, to your website directly or to a web browser directly. You want people to be able to call it from a browser. You use that. You use blob storage also if you are rendering things like streaming media service, where you store your streaming video, you know, and then audio files. You know, audio and video files, they are usually large, depending on the resolution of the video or the quality. So it can be that large. So this is where you store that type of file in Azure. Or you have uh, uh, logs, files that where you write a, a very large file or an application that writes a uh, log in a large you know, quantity. You can store that type of file in Azure Blob Storage as well. And then, uh, Moving on, let's talk about the disk storage. Disk storage usually is attached to virtual machine. So each virtual machine you create in Azure, you have to you have two type of disk that are attached to it or that you can attach to it. One is the operating system disk. It can be standard disk and it can be standard HDD or it can be standard SSD storage that you are attaching to it, to that particular virtual machine. And the disk you are attaching to those virtual machines, they are also referred to as virtual hard disk. And then just look at them like your physical hard drive that you install on your servers, on your physical servers on-prem. But now in virtualization, in virtualization environment, you refer to it as virtual hard disk. Uh, the disk can be maybe can be managed in two ways. It can be what we call managed disk. So managed disk is uh, uh, is is not okay. Uh, how will I put it? How will I put it? Um, let me see. So. A situation where the disk you want, there's no way that you don't want maybe people to have access. There's no way for people to have access to that particular disk from anywhere else other than within that particular virtual machine. So it's where you will use uh, disk storage. But just take it, it is usually attached to virtual machine. Take it as your physical hard drive on your computer. That is the disk storage. And if the third one that we'll be talking about, there are a whole lot of disk type that we have in Azure, really. But we're just picking these three to talk about them. The third one is the Azure file. Azure file actually enable you to set up a highly available network file share that can be accessed by using the standard um, the standard SMB ports that or SMB protocol, that's server messaging uh, block protocol. So take this as you setting up a server in your data center. And the purpose of that server is for you to be able to create uh, to create file share that different departments we have access to to store their data that they work on together. You know, data that you work on commonly together is what you store in a file share. So Azure file is you work the same way like that. The only difference is that you can um, connect to it from anywhere. 
unlike the on-premise option or the one in the VM that before you can make that possible, you have to do some form of publishing. And how do you connect to Azure File Share? You need, um, you will need uh, what we call storage um, access token. So if you have to connect to it, first for, for you, First, for you to be able to connect to any storage in Azure, especially the blob storage and the file storage or the table storage, you will need to have what we call a storage account. So it's that storage account that actually allow you to be able to connect to the storage wherever they are. So for you to do that, you need what we call access token. You have to generate, it's like a signature uh, base secret that you have to use add together with the url that tells it to go specifically specifically to a particular location and open that storage for you to maybe put your file in or something <clears throat> so that is uh, the way you use azure files share um so now uh, that we have talked about Azure storage, like I said, that there are a lot, lot of other storage. There's the blob storage, there's the, sorry, the table storage, the um, uh, queue storage type. So now we'll move on now to storage access tiers. Now, each of the storage, that you have or that you create in Azure, there is a type of access tiers that is assigned to it. So it's usually based on maybe whether you are using the storage frequently or you are using the storage to store data that are not often used or you are archiving the storage. So now it allow you the storage access tier. In this case, now we have three types, just like you're seeing in this, on the screen. We have the auth access tier. Auth access tier really has higher storage costs because it is on at the same time. So there are two costs that are attached to every storage type. There is the cost of the storage itself and there is the cost of accessing, that's reading and writing into the storage. For, for auth storage, the storage is more expensive compared to the uh, access cost. So you pay less for, the, for accessing it because it's auth, uh, data is being written into it and people are accessing it frequently. And Probably in which case or scenario will you have that? So we have um, um, data, the type of data or the type of access that you have, maybe data that, is in, that you are currently using or you are expected to be accessing that more frequently. Uh, Yes, you are expected to be accessing more frequently. So that type of file that you want, maybe you have a particular file that you work on daily, it's on a daily basis, you work on that particular uh, um, file, such file will be stored in the auth, uh, um, auth access tier where you can get access to it very quickly. And as compared to the cool, access tier, or you can call it code access tier as well. So the storage in this case is cheaper, but the access, when you are accessing that so reading and writing to it is more, is higher, it's more expensive. Because at this time, uh, as at the time you are writing, you might be writing maybe large amount of data at a particular period 
the time you are writing, there will be a lot of heat on that particular story. That's reading and writing processes. And processes in terms of um, in terms of CPU is actually also running to help you to write on it as fast as possible before maybe you stop writing. So you stop you store things that you access less frequently in the, this type of you know storage type or you use this type of access type for storage where you store things that you access less frequently. So the user scenario can include maybe backup. You, when you create a backup, most of the time you have to store the backup in a location and you don't get to use the backup data often. So it might be that you use it only maybe there's a there's an instance where maybe a particular file has been deleted and you, you need to now restore, or where there's a disaster and you need to quickly restore data from that particular um, storage. So those are the type of data you store in a cold storage type. And so you can also store media, media files, that's media content that are not often being used. You can store them also in this uh, location and large set of data also can, can be saved in, in this type of um, storage with this, in the in a storage with this type of access state. So the time by which you access data can be, can be at least, that's at least in 30 days, maybe you access it once in every 30 days, or you access it once in every, um, every 90 days or even, uh, uh, you know. So why we pick backup to be a very good example for this is when you schedule your backup, you configure your backup solution or your backup application, you have to configure what we call the schedule or backup policy that says backup a particular data maybe every week or you back it up every month and when you are back when you do weekly monthly or yearly backup you have to also say for how long that backup should be stored so if i pick monthly backup now and i say uh, i will create a backup now i won't touch that backup i won't touch that storage again until next month when i'm supposed to create another one month backup that's the time i will go back there to go and start writing into that storage now let's talk about the archive uh, access tier now that has the lowest cost in terms of storage and uh, it has the higher retriever uh, cost so things that you store here you want to take it now by the time you want to retrieve it you are going to be retrieving it taking it out of the archive storage probably into the art storage where you now be you know writing to you so at the end of the day it's going to be expensive for you that retriever process is more costly compared to the other two type where you have access things more frequently so this one uh um is usually contain or is used for data that are stayed in that particular archive location or that particular storage for about 180 days or more so we said the list is 180 days so uh uh that's the that's that's the type of storage you use this type of archive assets there for Um, so the archive storage now, you use it for long-term backup. Yes, long-term backup. I can also use maybe this backup, you know, in case for example, where you backup and you say each backup file should be stored maybe for six months or a year. So it means if it's six months, which is 180 days, you only access it every 180 days to write into it. Or every 12 months to write into it, right? So that's why the storage is not often used. 
so it's 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 very cheap but uh uh when it's time for you to retrieve that data maybe to restore that backup it can then be you will have to pay for that processing unit at that time and you can also use this kind of access tier for storage where you keep uh, data maybe because of compliance for compliance or purposes or security uh, kind of um, data like camera footage you want to store you can store your camera footage in this type of environment so where you record your camera you get the data go store it there and you forget it until when you need it that's when you always go back to it so really these are the type of access tiers or the way you accesses or the type of accesses that you have with the different storage that you create in Azure. Um, so we have two labs, is it two labs? So like I said, I will drop the lab file for us, for us to check. If my internet is not still grabbing, uh, we will be able to, but if it is, then we might have to kind of uh, skip it or something else. So let's quickly, let me quickly reshare my screen for us to create first. Where is it? Where is it? So one of the first thing we need to create is virtual network. I'm going to reshare my screen again. Please let me know if you cannot see my screen, but I guess you are seeing it. So we want to create virtual network. So like always, you can either click the create here or you just search for what you want to create and it will bring it. So if I click type rather virtual network, as you type virtual, it will already bring it. So virtual network. I'm going to click virtual network right now. I do not have any, so I'm going to create one. And now, in a situation or in a, in a scenario where you have um, where you have a requirement to host, where you have a requirement to host uh, resources that need to talk to each other on the on the same subnet, for instance. The first thing you need to do is to ensure that you create your virtual network. The virtual network should be existing. Then after you create a virtual network, that is when you can now go and create your virtual machine. And as at the point of you creating your virtual machine, you will now select the virtual network you want to connect it to. So I will pick again our textile resource group and give the network in name give the network a name so we have um styler vnet stylers vnet so again because the my resource group uh, uh or i've created resource before that i put in west europe automatically is suggesting west europe for me so I'll just maintain. The next thing I can decide to go to the, you notice here, you have the IP address here. So automatically it, will, it has given us a subnet. And this subnet, see how much IP I have in this subnet, a whole class A subnet, sorry, a whole class B subnet. So what I can do is to also break down this subnet into smaller unit. Like I can break it to a slash 24 or reduce it even further, depending on what I want to use it for. 
so I can divide this subnet to maybe I have a requirement to host all my application because of security. I want to host all my application in a particular subnet, host all the DBs in another separate subnet, host maybe my Active Directory or identity and security solutions in a separate subnet. So for application servers subnet to be able to talk to database subnet, I will need to do a form of allowing that routing between them. So this way now you have to use um, uh, you have to use uh, security S SGN. So you have to use um, sorry, uh, uh, the word is not coming right now, but I'm sure when we when we get there, uh, I will show you. So there's also a security gateway that is created, like a firewall where you open port. So you have to permit the port between there to say okay allow this particular IP from this subnet to be able to talk to the particular IP on this other subnet on this port or allow it to do any form of communication at all. So what I will just do is I will leave it. Already it has created a subnet, a default subnet for me. I can remove it and create my own. This is the class is giving us. If you look down, it has already given me a subnet of slash 24. I can add multiple subnets. Just like I said, if I have different subnet or different reason to host different server in different environment. So I will just leave it as default and click next, which is security. Now security, it does that's denial of service attack. I can decide to enable it. The more feature you enable really, the more payment you have to you know, do. I can decide to enable firewall, give it a name and which subnet address is it that I really want to protect with that firewall? But let's just leave it and go, you know, basically and just create a review. Just like your virtual machine when you are creating or your app service, you can also download templates to use to automate, you know, later what's uh, uh, for subsequent creation. So if I click this app service, for instance, Sorry, the um, if I click, you see, this is just some you know scripts or parameters that are set. So I can use this now to kind of host uh, to host to automate rather to automate the creation subsequently. So review and then I create. not supposed to take so long uh, for it to create and it bring us this interface to be familiar to, to us now where it tell us what and what is creating and the kind of these are all the parameters that we set while you know creating the app sorry while creating whatever it is uh, with the vnet that we are creating. So um, while this is going on, I can just go back. Okay, now let's just wait. Yes, so it's done. I can go to the resources to go and see the vnet that has been created. Now this is the vnet name, and see the information. This is the address space, it's a class B. And then right here, you scroll to subnet. You will see the default subnet that has already been created for us. And we have this much IP available. Though this is private IP. So this only allows communication within, uh, within the VM. So if I need, to make it available, any resource available. While creating that resource, I will automatically um, create some, what's it called? I will automatically uh, uh, select or choose to add public IP to that particular resource. So, and here you will see list of uh, devices that are connected to this particular uh, subnet. So we have created a VM, a VNet, 
the next thing now we need to create virtual machine. And I click new virtual machine. And uh, okay, this is not the account I used last last week. That's the account that was blocked. So that's why I don't have any VM here. So now select again the same process, then give it a name. Test V um, one and same availability set. So this is where I can choose, but right now I don't want any. I just leave a security type standard. I'll leave it as basic. Now this is where I get to select the image. That's the operating system that I want. So in this case, I want to use a Windows Server. I select. So you even have you have Windows Server 2022. You can select see all images. There are a lot of images that have been placed in the store. So I'll just pick, um, you know, image not valid for specific location. Okay, just to, so now I need to select the size of the VM that I want. In this case, now this is what is recommending standard. But let me go because I don't have so much money in this environment. So you can click that more and you will see more VM sizes available and the cheaper ones. So you can compare the prices for you to be able to select what and what. Now, the more resource you have, this is in terms of processor, this is in terms of RAM, this is disk, you know, and how many disk that is supported that you can have for a particular virtual machine. It's where you get this information and you can compare prices. So let's go for this small one for or this one, uh, B2, the B series. So I select this and then, yeah, I need to specify a name. I last AD, sorry, an account. It's like the local admin account that I'll be using to connect to this machine. Then I need to create a password for it. Mm -hmm. And then talk about, okay, NSG is what I was trying to remember the other time, NSG. So here, public inbound ports, I can allow whatever ports I want to allow. Yeah, now the RDP, because it's a window, I'll be able to do RDP. If I'm going to be hosting a web service on this server, I can select 80 or 443 also, depending. So you have to be careful here because for security reason, whatever port you have open, is actually going to be listening on that port. Then in terms of licensing, we talk a bit about hybrid license the other time. For maybe enterprise agreement customer or customer that uses a license that is called open, open uh, value licensing type, they can they already purchase Windows Server licenses. So they can bring their license to Azure. That way they will not be paying for the operating system license here. They are just paying for the compute. So we click, uh, now we talk about disk. The other time, this type of right now is picking by default. I'm just using it for test. So I'll pick standard HDD. I don't need it right now to be so fast. Uh, that's all I want to change here. Then I click next. Now, at the point of me clicking next, I have to select things like the virtual network. So you see, automatically, it has picked the virtual network that we created. And you see the IP that is picked, or the subnet it has picked already. 
Now, this where we are, this is where I'm saying, if I want the server to be reachable on the internet, then I need to request or assign a public IP to it. So automatically, it's going to create this one with this name. And then network security group, this is where I said we have to be creating port. Basic right now, we'll leave it as default. Public inbound port, you see, you see, it's still the same thing as what we saw. So I'll go, then if you want to enable hybrid, sorry, um, uh, load balancing, you turn it on. So I'll just go next. Uh, outside that, I really don't want to change anything. What I want to show is that we are able to see the virtual network that is attached. And I'll click next and say for for the this thing I pick, this is how much for the plan, the VM size that I pick, this is how much I will pay per hour. So I'll just click I'll scroll through, I'll just click create. So uh, while it's creating, I could say just a minute, yeah. So I can actually go back and it will create another one, another virtual machine. Because we have to create two virtual machines and test communication between the two virtual machines. So I don't have to just test VM2. And resource group, nope, yes, our uh, resource group existing, priority type, leave everything as that. So, VM, yes, operating system. So, you notice because I've used this before, it's giving me the same. It suggests based on what you used last. So, stylus ed. Yes. Let's just go. We've already seen all of this before. Next, the disk. Change it to standard HDD. Um, next, networking to ensure that it's speaking my VNet. So, and even actually remove this one. I don't need it. Or, or for us to test that we can connect remotely from outside to the two VM, then we can leave it. Uh, yeah, review and create. So the first VM has finished create, creating, and then this is the second VM now. So once you start creating, you can go and quickly connect to it. And this is where we'll stop today. Quickly connect to it and um, test connectivity. So I'll go. Now, if I go to click virtual machines to take me to this page, and this is the first one we, we created. So you notice the public IP. So this public IP, for instance, will allow me to be able to connect directly from my computer. So I can just either use this public IP to put my remote desktop app and put it and say connect, or I can click, select the VM. It's running. Why is it saying to start and start? Okay, hold on, let me go into it. So I can select the VM and say um, connect. See this connect option. So it's RDP that I enable on it. Remember with 33, the port 3389. If I click it, 
it's going to allow me to download you know, uh, a little package that already wrap the IP together with the port that I will be using. So I can download this file, or I can just go to my browser and, uh, sorry, I can go to my start menu, launch remote desktop, and enter the IP address that I copied earlier. Did I copy it? Yeah, I did. So I just enter and click connect. So it will go and ask me to log in. The second VM is also ready. So I'm going to use the account I created. It's a local account, so you need to remember to do this. This either type the name of the VM, that's test VM1, well, for faster, you know, connectivity, I just use dot backslash. This is representing any domain. Then I put my account name, which is Tyler's AD, and type my password. Okay, click connect. So. This is asking me to accept the certificate, but somehow if I trust it, as go ahead to connect, I'll just click yes. Um, while this is loading, let's connect to the second VM as well. So the second virtual machine is also ready. Close this and refresh. Yeah, we have the second virtual machine. So this one, let's use the other option. Click it again and click connect. Notice the public IP also. I can copy and use. I click connect and then it downloads, give me option to download also. A copy is very light. And this one, I can just click on it and do the same. Yes, I want to connect. Then you ask me to put credential. So you see that we are, either way you want to connect to the virtual machine, you can easily connect without uh, a problem. So now let's go back to the first one that is already started. And the VNet also give the computer or the server, give them access, internet access and everything. So here we go now to the TCP IP, or which we can also access from here. Click local server. You'll see the IP that is assigned to this machine. Okay, it's currently is DSCP. Now, what this means is each time you shut down the machine, the IP can change. So if I have an application that, oh, I want a server where I don't want the IP to change all the time, then I will need to make that IP static right from the VNet uh, setting of this particular virtual machine. So if we check it, let's see the IP that is assigned to us. Uh, you notice is an IP from that subnet. So yeah, is the IP 10.0.0.4 slash 24. And then you have the gateway is dot one. So if I go to the other server, we'll have the same, and then we can be able to ping between the two server. So it's also, so you notice this is dot four and the other one is dot five. So it is dot five. Seems 
you know, setting. So now, when they see each other, I will fire off my command prompt. My ping here, ping 10.0.0.5.4. I'm pinging from dot five to dot four. So right now, this is normal. I'll go here as well. CMD is the same result. Dot five. I'm doing continuous ping so that we can see when that ping you know start responding. Now this is expected because the machines they are actually in a work group environment and they only trust themselves right now. So if I need VM1 to be able to talk to VM2 within the VM itself, I need to enable what we call file and printer sharing. I'll just go to the network icon, click network that's setting, and I'm going back to the uh, uh, this thing that's network and sharing center, and I click change advanced sharing setting. So here, because it's a work group, uh, work group machine. You notice private is currently turned off. Public or guest is also currently turned off. So I can turn it on. Turn on file and printer sharing. We'll see when it starts responding. Uh, this is, is that the right one? That was private. Yeah. So can we see it? So the same thing I have to do here as well. To go to network and sharing center. And just go to control panel, network status, and change adapter setting, advanced settings, rather. Just turn it on and apply. That's under private. This is under guest now. So under private, uh, we turn it on and leave public off or private on. Private on and see. We also we go here. We should start getting response, and that is how the vnets. That's how they work with each other. That we are able to. Uh, what's happening here, guys? That they are able to talk to each other. That's that. Okay, I guess that is that public. Okay, so that's it. The servers are talking to one another. Let me stop this. Stop this as well. So we don't kill the servers in the cloud before Microsoft team. Probably we are. We are doing something. So that's that. The machine just disconnected, uh, got disconnected. So let's see, because we are already behind time. Uh, so basically, we have been able to create two virtual network, create two virtual machines, and test connection between them. So, that's the, um, the end of the class for today. Uh, I'll just stop sharing my screen. Do we have any questions before I kind of call it a day? Looks like we need to continue down around. Oh, if we can begin to answer the question again. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I, you're clear now. 
Yes, I think it looks like we need to um, get testing and do a lot of hands on before we can begin to ask our uh, questions. Thank you very much, Titi. Yeah, thank you. But can we leave questions in the chat during the course of yeah. the week? Yes, yes, okay. yes, you can, you can, actually. Uh, okay, uh, someone said battery is low. No problem, we can. I will drop the slides and um, drop the lab file so that you can have your hands on, on your own uh, within the week. So thank you everyone for your time. And um, I hope it's been a uh, great session for you and you've been able to learn one or two things. So like we said, if you have any question later during the week while you are going through your lab, uh, you can drop the question on the, um, on the channel and we'll pick it up to attend to you. If possible, if we have chances at that time and you need us to connect with you, we can actually go as uh, far as doing that with you. Uh, so thank you once again and do have a lovely day. I hate. Thank bye you everyone. Yeah, bye.